Welcome to a very special bonus episode of the e-commerce podcast with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. The e-commerce podcast is all about helping you deliver e-commerce wow. Now, all of the links, notes, and transcript from today's episode are available on our website at ecommercepodcast.com. Net. Now, in this very special Spotlight episode, we take a break from the usual deep dive into specific e-commerce topics and instead shine a light on a company that's making waves and doing some pretty impressive work in the world of e-commerce. And today, that company is Mason, who are doing some insane stuff in the world of AI, which as we all know, is a bit of a hot topic at the moment in the world of e-commerce. And our guest is uh, Kos Manjita, who is the CEO and founder of Mason. Now, Kos is a celebrated founder and expert product creator with over 16 years of experience in the world of commerce enablement. With a passion for making technology accessible and user-friendly, she has devoted her career to ensuring that everyone can reap the benefits of cutting-edge innovations. Now, Kos is a natural people person, which is a beautiful thing on a podcast, let me tell you. Uh, she loves connecting with fellow entrepreneurs and developers, marketeers, brand builders, designers, you name it, whether it's over a cup of coffee, on a Zoom call, through Instagram, or of course, on a podcast. Now, boasting an impressive background, Koss has honed her skills at industry giants such as IBM Commerce, Mintra, which is Walmart fashion in India, uh, and Paytm, which is part of Alibaba, working in diverse locations, including Atlanta, San Francisco, and India. All very enviable, I feel. And today, she divides her time between Toronto and Bangalore, leading an international team of talented creators at Mason, which all sounds extremely impressive, if I'm honest with you, Cos. So welcome to the show. Great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Extremely impressive, but also extremely tiring for some people. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I, I think once you get over once you get over that constant jet lag, you're like, you know what? I can sleep anywhere. Uh, I can <laughs> just take my break anywhere. We are good. Uh, so yeah. so I, it's interesting. So you must spend a lot of time on airplanes, right? Just traveling all I over do. the place. I do, yeah. but I'm raking up a ton of miles. I'm trying to use them as much as I can too. So. <laughs> So what's your top tips for dealing with jet lag? <laughs> I think the most important thing is that you got to, wherever you land, I mean, just behave like that's your schedule now, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And uh, it, it it's much better. At least for me, it works out much better. If I land in the day, I'm going to go through the day and I'm going to sleep as much as I can only at night. Um, and uh, strangely enough, I'm I'm realizing that there's just like little uh, you know, half an hour around 5.30 to 6, uh, 5 to 6 every evening um, that I actually feel super sleepy. And that works out whichever time zone you are in. So I try to take a power nap if I can for 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> it really boosts me up, yeah. So I think these are these are probably the two things. Uh, but okay. yeah, you've got to find your own rhythm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I took a power nap at 5.30, my nap would last probably until like 7 a.m. the following morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could do a 15-minute power nap that time of the day, but maybe 2 o'clock. But yeah, no, it's interesting. So you're, um, you're traveling, you know, doing a lot of travel. You've got teams uh, halfway around the world from each other in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, doing some great stuff at Mason. So tell me about Mason. How did you get started uh, in Mason, you kind of you've done some impressive stuff, you know, like with IBM and all that sort of stuff. But why Mason? How did you get involved in that? Yeah, and and I think it goes back to kind of like this um, very interesting dichotomy and mix. And I've used that statement of like over the years in in many many different settings. But I've always been, uh, you know, a very creative kid. Uh, love, love like painting, reading a ton of books, etc. Uh, gardening, I don't know, just hanging out with like <laughs> my dad and daydreaming in the backyard. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, avid science fiction reader, like Isaac Asimov was pretty much the first, you know, person, I think, well, I was in my sixth standard or something. And I just couldn't let go. I, I kind of ate up all everything that I could find around whatever he's written, Arthur C. Clarke and, and then Dune series and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so there's always been this like very interesting dichotomy that I 
that I've always uh, been in. And, and, and it kind of continued on, I guess, uh, uh, across this whole, you know, work experience, I would say, um, always straddling different regions, always straddling the world of technology and consumer behavior, uh, you know, um, and uh, somewhere when I was, uh, you know, working at Walmart's uh, Mintra in India, uh, it, it suddenly struck me that, you know what, uh, <laughs> the world's shifting. Uh, the enterprises are becoming, I would say, solopreneurial mm -hmm. rather than just an enterprise. And and every product, everything that we do, every system that we use is just getting more and more geared towards empowering that individual. Right. And so people like me who love creating great experiences, who love making technology simple. Um, I don't code. <laughs> I'm terrible at it. Um, yeah. but, but, <laughs> But can I work with people who code and yeah. can I work with AI or whatever else, uh, you know, happens? Um, and I can, can I continue to add value uh, to someone's life and to someone's goals, if something that they're trying to achieve every day using technology, right? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's been, I guess, the connecting dots throughout my <laughs> life. So when I was at Mintra, uh, uh, you know, we were, me and my co-founder, coincidentally, were working on a bunch of systems uh, to power revenue on the Mintra and Walmart pl platform in India. And so it was all about powering those, you know, um, uh, millions, 500 million plus, uh, you know, consumers who are uh, visitors who are coming in and powering them to take, to discover beautiful products, yeah. uh, enjoy the whole shopping experience, um, nudge them with decision with, with with things that help them take a decision to buy, right? Mm -hmm. And and but enjoy the process more importantly, right? What shopping shopping is not is a lot more than buying, right, Matt? It's it's shopping is fun. It's buying yeah. plus fun, I guess. Yeah. Um. So so somewhere along that line, uh, we realized that we've been working in large corporations for a while, uh, empowering large marketplaces, which are closed systems. End of the day, mm -hmm. um. And uh, we felt that. Why not kind of take all our learning, simplify it, no matter how powerful it is under the hood, but simplify it and take it to the rest of the 99% of retail, those solopreneurs, the brands, the you know, founders, the entrepreneurs, and actually yeah. help them help them, you know, get more more orders, get more revenue, essentially win. Right. So that's that's where I guess it all started. Wow. So this desire to bring the secrets of the big boys uh, and get them accessible to everyone. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I like absolutely. that. That's a, that's a great list. So when was Mason started? When did you take the leap from uh, Mintra into Mason? Uh, it was not a direct straight journey. It, it, it never is. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we, we, started, uh, we started something called Kubrick first. And that okay. was... I guess we were very early in generative AI. So that was all, Kubrick was all about, we were working in large marketplaces, remember? So a lot of our experiments, you know, gave us learning that, hey, uh, visuals, creatives, uh, great, great looking products, great looking, you know, videos around products, all of that really helped shoppers engage and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they love it. Um, so, but, but it's a lot of work. We had like a hundred member, sorry, it started with a 30 member team and then was moving towards a hundred member content wow. team uh, wow. to actually just power all that beautiful things that you see on any platform, um, any shopping platform. And uh, we said that, hey, like, you know, uh, generative AI is interesting. Uh, this was 2018, 19. And we said that, hey, we both wanted to, uh, you know, now create this uh, AI platform for generating all the shopping content. Uh, visual content and um, we were a little early <laughs> Gen, AI, Gen AI is not where it is today it was mm -hmm. it was you know a while back and uh, at some point in 2019 we realized hey this is you know we are early um, we will need a lot more funding and a lot more research and a lot more you know ammo to actually make a make a difference right so yeah um, so yeah so but but during that time we kind of chanced upon this whole idea of empowering smaller brands uh to do better sales so we kind of pivoted and we stopped kubrick and then we moved on to do mason uh we launched it first in 2020 in the middle okay. of the pandemic good time uh, to launch a business yeah <laughs> perfect isn't it yeah um and about uh, may to june and yeah so we've been what like for about 
two and a half years. Gonna gonna be three years this year. Yeah. Okay. So and two and a half to three years in digital terms is actually a really long time, isn't it? It's um it's it's a yes. when you think about the technological changes just in the last two to three years alone. I mean, it's, it's quite astounding stuff that you guys must have witnessed just in your own business, I would have thought. Yeah, I think just the last couple of months itself, the whole world's gone to see. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I, I, you know, uh, prompt engineering wasn't mm -hmm. even a domain. And now everybody's like, hey, how to be a prompt engineer, right? So, so yes, yeah. uh, it, it, things, things change super fast. But what we realized, and I was actually talking to someone today um, uh, from the Signal Fire NFX. You would have seen that uh, uh, NFX uh, uh, online, and they do a ton of interesting content uh, around all this, you know, interesting trends that are happening in the ecosystem, startups, technology, mm. and all of that. Backed by a VC fund, but NFX itself is a really amazing site to uh, kind of find out what's what's happening. And uh, uh, very interestingly, they said that. You know what, um, it, it's in the end, it's all about, are you powering something super fundamental? Like, what is it? Like you strip away all the jargons and all the tech, right? And all mm. everything else. Like, what is the fundamental problem that you're solving, right? And when you look at it, commerce is so fundamental. It's like so basic human nature. Like there's always been trade. We always need things. And there's yep. always someone out there who has that thing to offer. And uh, yeah, so so at, at the core of what we do is essentially uh, we want to power someone uh, to find something that they love and at the right price, at the right time, right? And, and so we want to also help the person who's selling it sell better, right? So that's that's the core of it. So I think I think as long as you are very true to that fundamental, it, it, like yeah. everything else just falls in place. Yeah. So how do you guys? Um, I mean, that's a great statement. Is it almost like a mission statement, isn't it? What you've just said, and yeah. how do you guys then fulfill that? How, how do, what's the outworking of that um, in Mason? Yeah, I, and that's a great question because you know there there's always uh, tons and tons. Retail is like a red ocean. Like retail tech is a red ocean. It's as old as retail itself. Mm. There's always been new technology that's helping you know mm. large or small teams do stuff. And uh, uh, you know when when you step back and you think about it, uh, what's the problem in the in the whole ecosystem today? And uh, the first generation of commerce, online commerce, was all about these marketplaces like Amazon, etc. Right, and nobody had a clue like how do I sell, how do I buy, like both sides like, yeah. clueless. And they said that we'll give you this black box. You don't, you just don't have to worry about anything. You want to sell, come here. We'll help you do everything else. You want to buy, just come here. You're fine, right? And then the next generation, like, but that was a black box. So the next generation of, uh, I guess, online commerce is like Shopify or yeah. e commerce or all of that, right? And they're saying that, hey, like, why, why the seller? Like, why are you stuck on, on that platform, right? Like, mm -hmm. you need to kind of talk about who you are beyond just being like a Craigslist, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, you, you should stand out. And so why not create your own personality and create your own presence? And so that is the next generation of commerce, which is, again, you know, your own store and stuff mm -hmm. like that, right? Uh, but actually, at the core of commerce is us, the consumers. It's yeah. us, like we are buying, right? It's, it's not, yes, definitely the brands who are selling us stuff, but the core of it is we need something. That's where someone can sell something to us, right? Yeah. If we didn't need it, it just wouldn't matter. Even if yeah. you give stuff for free, people don't want it if you don't need it. So the next generation of commerce how we see it online commerce is 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 moving already if you see the tiktokification of commerce that we that I love that phrase now. the tiktokification right. i love that right and it's all about all about like the discovery the engagement like mm. getting to get getting to discover interesting things that maybe you're just super excited by and you might just buy. So, so it's selling at the point of inspiration, selling at the point of intent, right? It's not forceful. It's not a search based commerce world, right? It's, it's helped. It's the whole new next generation is all about discovering this beautiful, yeah. amazing things to sh that you might just want to shop or shop. And so what we are doing fundamentally is 
we want to be that infrastructure that helps with the consumer first commerce work right like right. That, that we want to, we want to kind of eliminate the middleman and help brands and you know consumers connect uh, on an open market like why a closed market right so that's that's our i guess the epic calling or the vision and yeah how we do it today is like we help you first understand your consumers so there's a mm. lot of like discovery engagement related you know modules and then the next step towards is once you understand your consumers, right? Now, how can I help that consumer take a decision to buy? That's what, so that's the next phase of what we yeah. do, which is essentially just, you know, part one, I guess, is understanding and getting to know your consumer. And uh, part two of our product is about now taking that knowledge and then helping the consumer take a decision to buy. In a yeah. very, in a very simple way, that would that would be what we do. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I love how you simplified it as well, because I, I, I appreciate under the hood, it's probably a little bit more complex <laughs> uh, than that. But um, I, I love what you were saying there about how um, at the core of commerce is the consumer who wants something, who needs something. Um, and the rest of it is, 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 is OK, but you've fundamentally got to have the demand from someone to buy, right? Demand and supply. You've got to have that demand there from the consumer. Um, yeah. And uh, I loved your phrase, the TikTokification. I might use that. Uh, you should. You yeah, should. yeah, the TikTokification. It's not actually an easy word to say, but I get what you mean. Uh, you know, yeah. you buy it where you're sparking this sort of desire uh, in people, and you're and you can sh you can you know talk to that and shop around that. So you're you're taking then people through this process, which one helps them understand their customer. Yeah. Which for me is 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 one of the critical things to e-commerce now, isn't it? Is understanding who your customer is. And then yeah. to under, taking that understanding to then go, right, how can I best sell to them? How can I uh, best um, promote them? And so I'm assuming, given that uh, Kubrick was involved in generative AI, that you've sort of snuck in a little bit of that AI learning uh, into Mason. And um, so how does... Am I right, one, in, in saying that? Is there is there sort of some AI trickery involved in this whole process? Trickery is the wrong word. Magic maybe <laughs> the right word. AI magic involved in this. Yeah, and and yeah, you, we can't run away from it. Like my someone we know, like one of our oldest, I guess, you know, backers and and advisors, and uh, he he once uh, you know jokingly told us. Uh, that, oh, the OGs in generative AI, They're like yeah, but <laughs> but jokes apart, I guess um, you you can't run away from it. I mean, there's definitely mm. see at the core of it, what we want to do is essentially as you you know we want to connect the consumer and the and the shopper rather and and the seller right in a way. And uh, um, but you know sellers are overwhelmed. Like you know your your core, I guess. Uh, skill is that you can identify once you understand what consumers need you can find that thing and you can yeah. package it and you can give it to them right but now why why are you having to know what's a web hook what's an api how do i set up this how do i set up so there's like so much of like constant learning about things yeah. that are probably not really required or you're just operating all the time like multiple tools you know so much tech so much of like burning out so, so, so AI definitely helps in because it brings that intelligent decision making. Mm -hmm. As long as you can set the parameters, right? Yeah, so, for example, yeah. very, very simple example being just, you know, how, how, what, what sort of discounts can I give to, you know, shoppers who are probably engaging with a product but not buying that product at that point in time, right? Would that shopper? have a propensity to just like be excited by a discount would that mm -hmm. shopper not be excited so there are many different signals that you can use to even as a as a as a person that's what you'll do you'll say that hey that guy was like looking at that product for a long time was hovering over the price but then can i kind of not buying maybe he's worried about the price maybe i'll tell him about you know the like dude i can give you a five percent discount like something yeah. of that sort like that's yeah. that's what you would do in the real world too so, so as long as we can set like these sort of boundaries and <laughs> objectives for the system, the system can then keep, you know, running those experiments, iterations, whatever, and then can actually eventually figure out what sort of consumer, you know, behavior and insights will 
you know, lead to what sort of outcome. Right? Yeah. And they learn super fast and they can be like multi, you know, multi-threaded. So they can do like millions of consumers at the same time, like, which is not possible for you. Uh, and, and they can take so many different signals, which again is super hard for people to yeah. process, right? Um, so, so that's how you kind of sneak in, as you said, the power of AI, right? Because at the end of the day, if you want to help uh, each shopper connect with the right seller and the right product that the seller is selling at the right time, then there's a ton of different data signals, right? Yeah. And you need to take quick, instant decisions to now do something, right? And that is decision making is what is simplified with AI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, this like, data and insights and analytics is a, a very important module too. Uh, you know, automation is an important module that we have. Uh, you know, vertical specific, which is like if you are in beauty and personal care, how mm -hmm. you have to sell sort of changes than if you are in groceries. So we have like vertical specific, category specific, uh, you know, uh, strategies and playbooks and apps. So all of that are the different modules, but yes, right. they're powered by this like, smart decision making engine. And uh, at a very simple way, it's like a set of rules that you set, but the system's like smart because it's an AI. So it's like learning as it's, you know, successful or not successful yeah yeah no that's great sounds great and i'm curious uh because when you talk about um the ability to handle all of this data um if i'm listening to the podcast and thinking well this all sounds great and, and interesting and helpful um but i'm just starting out is is mm. is what you do still helpful for the startup or or do i need like a million lines of sales data before it starts to get yeah. interesting. Yeah, actually, uh, honestly speaking, forget about the data, like keeping the data aside. If you are in, in your e-commerce journey, right? Or in your brand journey, you're mm -hmm. a brand founder and you're still trying to figure out product market fit. Like you're still figuring out what sort of product should I even, you know, what sort of category should I exist yeah. in? Like what's my sweet spot, right? What is the kind of customer? Like, am I selling to only Gen Z women or like, am I also kind of branching out into millennials? Like, where am I, right? So if you are still in that, you know, what product market fit, you know, phase, right? Then of course, keeping a system in the middle that's helping you sh your consumer shop better mm. is, is essentially, I think, an overkill, right? Because you have you have product market fit. You have zero to one journey to cover. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same, even if I'm a, um, a you know, software startup, right? Like mm -hmm. before I, I find product market fit, before I figure out what's the problem and how I want to solve it, like putting any sort of growth engines is like meaningless, right? So we usually, uh, you know, operate in the sweet spot of, you know, once you've found product market fit, maybe at about, you know, one to two million in GMP um, mm -hmm. and, and then beyond. That's where, you know, your question of, what am I even selling? Like, who am I? That, that's gone. And then now you're trying to like figure out how do I continue to scale, scale, scale and uh, without having to put like a ton of people, systems, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. And so is, is what you do um, something that connects, say, with Shopify? Or is it its own standalone store? I mean, um, who, who's your, who's your target market, I suppose, in, in, with, uh, with yeah. Mason? Yeah, we, we are, um, uh, you know, we have out of the box, uh, apps and plugins for different ecosystems. So on Shopify, we have an app called mode magic, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can, you don't need to like integrate it to your store. You can literally just install it from the app store and then you get like all these different, you know, capabilities. I was talking about all these different apps all of mm. that like connected through that, right? Um, so we definitely have like default, I would say single click integrations uh, in, a, in a nerdy way um, uh, available. Um, but then as, as you sort of start becoming bigger, you might use more customized platforms that yeah. we've seen for some of our, uh, we primarily sell to SMB and mid-market you know, brands, uh, mm -hmm. we do happen to have some brands who are, of course, in the larger part of mid market kind of like getting into the enterprise space. So they start doing a lot of customizations. That's where mm -hmm. we have open APIs where they can, uh, you know, do integrations and stuff. But that's not like a large part of 
who we serve is. So mm-hmm. our goal is to, as as I mentioned, like help everybody as much as possible, as a large part of retail as possible, get powerful, you know, strategies and technology and systems, mm-hmm. uh, but in a very simple and easy way. So uh, having default integrations, having like apps that are like one click, easy for you to just put on top of Shopify, for example, is, is very yeah. important. So we have, we have, we are out of the box on Shopify. If you're on Shopify, you just have to go to the app store, find us, install, and you're done. Mm-hmm. Um, same for uh, BigCommerce, uh, WooCommerce, etc. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, it's good to hear that actually it's not, not just Shopify because I, I love Shopify as a platform. I do, and. It, we we always we we've had people on the show who talk about oh we can do this with Shopify we've got this app this integration, um, mm. and I I do I am a big fan of Shopify but I'm not on it myself mm. uh, you know I have my yeah. own custom site and so it's nice to hear that there's an API function where I can just suck all the A uh, AI magic out of you guys and and help my business with that. <laughs> Um, I love that's that. great. Yeah. So what kind of, I mean, I was just talking about e-commerce businesses then, uh, cost, what sort of, um, what sort of success stories are there of companies that have seen maybe great results with, with your tech, with Mason's technology? Yeah, we have like recently started actually being a little proactive about getting all these success stories and, you know, we are product founders and I think like that's one, I think off topic. <laughs> line of thread that I'm, I'm tugging at but I, I think I keep like every time I meet a founder who's like a product founder and I'm like you know what just get out there and think about marketing or talking about what you do like these are important things like you can't be like hacking away in your you know in your yeah. garage forever but but you gotta you gotta have case studies like people understand stories I think fundamentally so mm-hmm. you have to you have to think about like how do you pull out those case studies but think of them as customer stories end of the day so yeah we do, we are getting a little diligent about it and we do have a few customer stories but interesting things that we're seeing is that um uh, you know uh, one of the interesting teams and i love that uh, because that was one of the first customer stories that we did the sports uh, uh, and uh, fitness uh, express and uh, you know single founder running this uh, kind of like a sports and fitness, uh, you know, store selling mm. to uh, U.S. Uh, you know, he's he's based out of U.S. and selling to U.S. customers, and uh, and he was like, I think he was like struggling with this, like, how do I have so many different things to do, and now I have like he's on Shopify, and Shopify App Store, if you notice, is crazy. It's like what eight thousand, nine thousand different oh, apps. The, the choice is overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it. Mm. And every other app's like, you know, I, I get your most conversions, take us. And and so <laughs> he was thinking, he was like, I need like this, this like one thing where I don't have to worry about like homepage or PDP or channel or what. I need like something for my browse to buy journey. Like it's as simple as that. My shoppers are coming to my homepage, to my store, wherever, home, PDP, doesn't matter. And then they're dropping off. So I don't want them to drop off. I want them to stay on my store and get to buy. Like mm. it's as simple as that. Can I get a solution that sort of like connects the dots, right? Um, so I think over the first just three to four weeks, he got uh, seventeen thousand uh, dollars additional in sales. It's a small store, uh, but they were so excited, and we were like, mm. "I would you know be too." Yeah. Got- yeah, and we were like, we got to do more stories like this. Like, why weren't we? We are all looking at data all the time. You know, <laughs> you're like, yeah, we are adding 35% uplift and uh, 25% uh, more ATS and blah. And you're like, man, like, no, stories. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's stories where it's at, right? People love yeah. a good story, yeah. don't they? Uh, yeah. Stories and, with good endings as well. Yeah, and why does that 17 came? When you think about it, that was something that was just lying on the table for him. Mm. And it's it's a lot for a small brand for a single founder. It's it's you know it's it's um, it's the power to be independent. No, it's also. I mean, I'm curious. What did so he installs the app on his um, fitness store, which is a Shopify site. Yeah. Um, what sort of things did he use from your technology that really helped him? Yeah, yeah. A couple of examples are, you know, very simple. You always think about like everybody does this cart recovery stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, but you tend to forget that, you know, a bunch of people kind of keep your store on on their desktop or on their phone, on their browsers, and they keep com- they like 
they chance upon it. They come back mm. to that tab at some point in time. So, you know, a simple, very simple embed. That's not like, not a pop-up, not interruptive, but an embed that just shows up and then gives you, if you are a person who likes discounts because you have done some stuff on the store mm -hmm. and you're kind of like, you know, there is the, the AI has figured out that, you know, uh, cost loves, loves a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> so it drops you that right, you know, discount, of course, keeping the margins in mind. Um, we just saw such a big change in how shoppers were reacting to that, right? Yeah. People sometimes just need a reminder. But they don't like if the reminder is dropping in on email. It's too intrusive. Like, hey, I, I left the store tab open for a reason. I'm not like, don't you don't have to remind me. I get super, mm -hmm. I personally get a little annoyed when I get like, we are missing you. And here are mm -hmm. things you left in the cart. I'm like, I left it in the cart for a reason, right? I'm, I'm going to go back if I want it. And, uh, and then, you know, um, if I'm a discount hunter or, or a bargain hunter or just everybody loves a sweet deal, right? Mm. Uh, so if I see that something that was at, uh, you know, $50 is $45, why? Like, and it's for five minutes, why not? You know, that's, that, that's the tipping point. So that yeah. was one very simple example of, you know, how um, a very common strategy like cart re recovery reminders, but then mm -hmm. you just add this intelligence to it to make it way more palatable for the kind of consumer intent that you have, right? It's not a blanket pop-up or right. an email that's thrown at everybody yeah, by yeah. just personalizing, you know, hey, Matt or hey, God. No, right? It's, it's something that's kind of like looking at your behavior and looking at you as a person and how you're thinking and how you probably have interacted. And then depending on that, showing you different versions of that match. Mm. And we, we saw that's actually one of our, you know, very, very high performing strategies. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. So I, I guess one question which then comes into my head, Koss, as you're, as you're talking is, um, if, if you're using this technology to make these intelligent sort of decisions you know the sort of intelligent thinking yeah. so we're going to give this this particular cost is on the side again we know we need to give her this discount to get her motivated to go to the next stage we're not going to send her a shed load of emails um but we're going to do x y and z we're going to give her the five dollars off the fifty dollar purchase or whatever it is yeah. but we're going to put a time restraint on there of five minutes so you got five minutes so okay i'm gonna buy the power behind that which is obviously what you guys do at mason does that, because this has come up uh, in a conversation with several people recently, and I'm, I'm curious yeah. to, to, to see how you respond. Does that affect my site speed? Does that slow yeah. things down because yeah. a computer somewhere is having to think of a trillion different things at once to, to create an output? Um, or, yeah. or, or, or have you sort of managed to get it to do all of this sort of stuff uh, in, a, in a nanosecond? Yeah, and a lot of this is actually something that needs to be constantly thinking, right? Yeah. Um, so, so when Matt dropped off, right, why did he drop off, right? Like, what do you think can, would be a best way to kind of engage him when he comes back? Like, what would be the best kind of things I can do, right, right to when he comes back? I think these sort of decisions have to, are running uh, uh, constantly, right? And uh, that's, because you can't, you like, you can't wait for me to go there, do this complex computation across, I don't know, 30 days of data, and then probably come back and generate that experience too, because that, that, that let's say that widget or that, you know, embed or that little yeah. carousal that comes up is actually generated on the fly too, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if you're waiting for all of that, of course, it would, uh, the, your site, your store wouldn't slow down, your site wouldn't store, slow down, but that nudge will not be there on, at, on time. Uh, yeah. and, and you've got like, what, three, five seconds to kind of grab mm. someone's attention today. It's crazy. And, uh, and we're all goldfish. So, so yes, we do a lot of these, <laughs> these computations. We kind of constantly make, uh, the system is constantly looking at things that are happening and kind of thinking through what can be done next and kind of keeping that in a way, in memory and ready. If, if, uh, but of course, like things like generating that little thing. Nowadays, they don't. It does. It just doesn't take time. You've seen, you know, the Chat GPT and how it works, right? So, oh yeah, and how um, quick it can uh, be. Uh, yeah. yeah, how? And, and by the way, like it's just 
showing to us that it's typing, but actually that entire picking answer has been ready <laughs> since you typed. <laughs> anyway, Sarah, <laughs> just put it on the screen already. Yeah, uh, it's giving you a feeling that it's a person and it's thinking yeah, yeah. and it's typing. Yeah. No, it's it's all there, right? So um, it it was there the moment you asked the question. So many of these systems are super super, uh, you know, fast to generate yeah. something, but of course, like computing what to generate is something that you have to do as things are happening and you have to on constantly kind of like refine your understanding of that person on the other side and that's yeah. what the system does yeah. and that's your system isn't it that all that computing power is on your end it's yeah. not on my end yeah no it's not it's it's on the cloud it's in our you know in our systems yeah that's that's mm. not that's not at all operating on plant or anywhere else in your store yeah, okay. Uh, let me go back, uh, Costa, something you said earlier. You used this phrase, the no-code. Um, you, you didn't code, uh, you know, the no-code thing. So what's your take on the sort of the no-code movement and how it's changing? The, well, probably explain what no-code is um, and, then, and then explain how you think it's changing e-commerce and, um, you know, for brands and marketplaces. I like to say, and I posted about that, and I didn't get like I, I post on Twitter like once in a million years. I used to post on Twitter once in a million years, and then I expect that tweet to go viral, and it of course didn't. <laughs> I you know what? I'm funny. laughing because I'm exactly the same. I genuinely am exactly the same. I can't remember that. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> but, but isn't it like I'm like, why it was so smart? Why isn't anybody engaging with it? But yeah, yeah I'm posting like once in a million years, 2009, 2019. Like that's literally yeah. the two tweets. But uh, <laughs> I, I love this example that just hit me one day was that you know um the quill was the og <laughs> no code right like before that you were like taking that hammer and that thing and you're like you know in this clay tablets and you're like ramming away and you're writing things and then the quill came and it changed everything because now anybody can write right so mm -hmm. that's that's so no code is no codification essentially is actually making something so simple that anybody making a technology simple enough for everybody to have access to it we just call it no code happen to call it no code today right yeah. and it's the same with uh, when you think about it with spreadsheets right like databases like all complex things and spreadsheets are so simple like who's gonna go and when you think about like having a database and having sql queries and running and trying to compute it's scary but then a spreadsheet does a lot of smart and intelligent and very difficult computing at just a tiny function that you can you know you can just see equal sum and then mm -hmm. wow I can I can like do summation across like a hundred different uh, you know rows and columns so so that's what no codification is all about right it's actually right. making technology simple enough for everybody to have access to it I mean if the printing press didn't happen like we will still be like printing press is giving us no code version of knowledge right so yeah or gave us the no-code version of knowledge. So I think that's, I think, is is what no-code is, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we tend to call it a no-code movement. Doesn't mean that, oh, whether coding or not coding is important. I think that's not the question here. The question yeah. is, can we give subject matter experts the power to create, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, in the online world, in the digital world, the tech world, it could be create apps. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think. It's a good explanation of no code. So, yeah. how is it? But how it didn't it go viral. That, that you, didn't go you, did, <laughs> <laughs> no. you can just, it just. I tell you what. I'll follow you on Twitter, and then uh, when I go on in ten years' time, I'll like it, and then maybe it will go viral. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, so, apart from the tweet, obviously, um, and you know the, the 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 sort of the take thing you have on no code. How does that? How does that change things for the for the e-commerce entrepreneur? And it does, right? Because today uh, we were talking about it. Like, why do I have to know what's a web hook, what's an API? And like mm. everybody does it. You like an API, you're fine, right, Matt? You are one of one of very few. But a large part of e-commerce brand mm. creators, founders, like it's just a lot of things that you have to learn, which may probably yeah. Your, your core skills are not that. Your core skill is probably curation of great products. Like you look at something and you know that this will click with this kind of 
shoppers for this yeah. sort of reasons, right? And and uh, so what no code gives is the ability. It 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 simplifies complex things and gives you the ability to do things on your own. Um, again, for example, like this whole price drop thingy that I was talking about, right? Like you wanna engage people who are. Uh, or rather, you want to power shoppers who are engaging with certain products, but you want mm. to take a decision to give them certain discount in, in some places, not in other. And you want to also define probably the boundary of like, hey, that nudge that you give has to look like my brand colors. And, you know, you should I, I, I want it in this way and I don't want it as a pop up. I want it as a like, you know, this sort of like a embed or a banner mm. or whatever. These decisions, it's like, imagine today how people do it. They're like, you have to work with developers or someone who at least knows something uh, or yeah. install like yeah. a four or five different apps and know how to, how all of that work yeah. together. Like even that's, that's like hard, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what no code, any sort of no code systems do, and there are so many now, all right? Uh, it's just, it's just makes things self-serve. Mm -hmm. um, and gives you the power to run your business on your own terms and go live with your ideas and your strategies and your decisions mm -hmm. fast. And it's so powerful because the fundamental construct of that is that you can now test what works for your shoppers instantly, right? Yeah. If you want to go from launch, like if I'm a yogurt seller and I want to move to like oat milk yogurt, like is that something that shoppers will even engage with, right? Like before I even invest in creating oat milk yogurt, maybe I want to like test that out, right? Yeah, yeah. If you had if you had to wait like a million years to just run a survey or just ask few people, like you would never be able to do it. So mm. it empowers people to to run their business much, you know, uh, much faster, I guess, on their own. Yeah. Terms. No, I like that. Uh, uh, it sounds uh, as you were talking, I'm thinking, you know, this is probably why chat GPT is captured everybody's imagination because they've mm. boy, they've managed to take something so complicated and boil it down to I just feel like I'm chatting to I can talk to you like I could talk to a normal human and somehow you've yeah. made that you've made that work. I know yeah. there's this big thing around prompt engineering, um, which yeah. in effect is still the coded version of AI, isn't it? But it it seems to be that actually most people can get reasonably good stuff out of AI without really knowing crazy prompt engineering. They just yeah. need to know how to talk to people or talk to the AI, right? And that, yeah, that simplification, yeah. I think, is a great idea. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and that's why I feel like what ChatGPT, it, it's not like OpenAI didn't exist, mm. but ChatGPT made it no good to, an ex, to a great extent. And I, you'll see more and more, we should see more and more things like that happening, right? Because it just makes takes away the operational overheads of anything. Like if I wanted to publish an ebook, it would be like, oh my God, research and writing and this stuff. Mm -hmm. You can get like the first version. Of course, it's it's a GPT version. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but it's out there. And now you can spend your time doing things that are more important. Like mm -hmm. when do you wanna, what kind of information you wanna put? How do you wanna engage yeah. your reader? Like what is, interviewing experts to put those quotes and case studies in there. Why should you waste your time just researching, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. no quotes, super powerful, yeah. Yeah, no, incredible, incredible. So where do you think it's all going? What does the future look like um, with with all of this stuff? You've got generative AI, you've got no code, you've got Mason doing some funky stuff, you've got e-commerce just exploding still. Um, where do you Where do you see it all going? I think more open markets, um, you know, where, uh, you know, if both sides, and it's important for both sides, right? As, as shoppers, right, as, as consumers, and, and we kind of <laughs> touched upon it, I think like the whole interesting part of, of commerce is shopping and shopping is that shopping is so much more than buying. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, in, in today, a lot of what we used to do, think of shopping on the online world, I was so away from what how we used to shop in the offline world, right? Mm. Every day, it's not about search-based shopping. It's not like you search for T-shirt, V-neck, X X Y Z, and then you get that exact thing, and then you have you know your twenty choices, and you take it or leave it, right? So it, it, this is very interesting video by Connie Chan, and I'm, I, I, I'll forward that to you. You mm. love it. 
it's yeah. where she talks about this like discovery based entertainment based shopping like this whole world of commerce is moving to something where you can find things that you love that works for you right and so mm. technology and ai will not just impact the shopping and the buying experience but also you know the the creating of the product experience right like can we create over time like manufacturing etc where you know if i like v neck but i like the same color and you like but you like a round neck can we get the same t-shirt in our mm. own personalized ways but i get it at a discount because i'm a discount hog you're not so you get it <laughs> how you like it right so i think any stuff like that is where you you are going to move to because technology and ai and a lot of things that we do in mason is going to impact the way shoppers are you know discovering yeah. loving and finding the right products and i'm sure there's going to be like this very interesting movement in your manufacturing and all of that that's going to get that personalized incredible product to the shopper back yeah right so so that's what i i think is is going to be the future of commerce it's super exciting yeah it is I, I and i i agree i think this this sort of the ability to personalize which is more than just putting somebody's name on something isn't it you know yeah, it's yeah. um the ability to personalize is becoming more and more interesting to me and and uh, whether it's print on demand 3d printing i mean you can even you can get most things like i can get bespoke meals made for me now and all kinds of stuff yeah. can't you and it's yeah. it's um it's interesting to see where where that's all going to that actually the the ones yeah. that are winning well, it's winning yeah. long term the ones where you can certainly make better profit seems to be in this this high level of personalization right yeah and and that all boils down to whether you understand the person on the other side or not right and so having you know the power and the capability to understand and constantly refine your understanding of that person and the shopper on the other mm. side becomes super powerful and very very important without that like you you can't personalize because you're you're superficial yeah that's so true very fascinating very fascinating so um cos what sort of things are you guys working on at mason at the moment what sort of what 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 have you got in your dev, dev pipeline what some what are some of the exciting updates that maybe you can share that are coming up i'm i'm really curious <laughs> i think the first like it goes back to what we i just mentioned about how can we help how can you understand your shoppers better and constantly refine that understanding and a lot of it is not just like first party third party data that we are we do we do operate in that world but can we move to zero party data like can we help you understand the consumer because the consumer or the shopper is telling you what they want right mm -hmm. uh, so in the world of bpc in the world of beauty and personal care it's about you know i it's very personal so i do care that my skin is dry and i want you know a water based or a serum based moisturizer don't give me an oil based one right mm -hmm. i'm willing to give you that information as a brand or a seller if i know that you it'll help you find yeah. the right product for me right so yeah. so giving more generative and ai power to help you understand the consumer at that zero party level that's like a big leap that's coming up uh, soon i'm very very happy to give you a sneak peek before it goes out to the world and and oh, you. you're on the list now you're on the list yeah yeah, yeah. Really make that. sure you do yeah yeah for sure yeah. no that'd be awesome and i i guess um my the question i've been saving up um cost for since the start of this conversation where did the name mason come from I, look at it. I, a lot of people do ask me because they're like mason sounds like something that's like a builder and this that actually it's a little bit more philosophical than that and we think of like me and my co-founder were like we were like kind of in the fag end of kubrick and just like thinking about starting this and and we were thinking like we kind of had this like you know a little hazier version of this view uh mm -hmm. and a lot more clear and now i'm sure it'll be way clearer one year down the line or two years down the line but we knew somewhere that shopping's changing fundamentally uh online shopping has to become more and more like how shopping used to be mm -hmm. uh very personal very you know uh about me and who's yeah. selling me right and um and uh, we knew it needed something very fundamentally different in the kind of technology that will power you to reach that world right it, it's it's a big shift and for us masons are 
the people who actually build new worlds and build new things things right so we we were talking about like hey you know when mars the colony in mars starts and elon musk gets there you know the first people who are going to be there are like the masons they're going to set up like the <laughs> whole you know mm -hmm. whatever little dome and have get people the dead these masons are going to build like the mar first mars colony and then you know we were like why not call ours call ourselves mason because it just feels like we are kind of building that first you know that that first building yeah, yeah. blocks and infrastructure of this new world. So yeah, mm. very philosophical. Yeah, yeah, very philosophical. Was that? Um, I, I, it's one of those things that uh, quite a lot of people struggle with when they name their company coming up with a new name. Uh, was it something that instantly came to you guys, or was it like this took months to just to figure out the name? I think it just came. We weren't really like planning about mm -hmm. it like consciously uh thinking about what's the name gonna be but both of us are super obsessed with names like every time we launch a feature or a product or a new app or an engine we are constantly thinking, what's the name what do we call it <laughs> because, <what> is, <laughs> because i think a lot of times that is your north star in some way mm -hmm. like when you define that your um i guess your dna and your ethos sort of aligns with it in some yeah. way uh, yeah, so we are, we are obsessed with naming. <laughs> so I think it's, uh, I, I don't remember it very consciously, but I'm sure that it was like chug lots of beer and coffee. <laughs> and <one thing. laughs> usually the, yeah, yeah, usually the, the sort of the essential ingredients to find a good company name. Um, listen, Cost, this has uh, been a great conversation and I genuinely really enjoyed it. And if people want to find out more, um, about Mason, if they want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Get Mason.io, our site. We have, uh, you know, our, our e-commerce expert team. They love helping and talking to people as much as I do. Uh, so we have like this little form and you fill it up. Someone's going to call you, you know, have a great conversation with you, at least at the very least. Or, you know, I love, still love talking to everybody that I can as much as my time permits and mm -hmm. i you know get into customer calls as often as i can and so if you ever are on linkedin i'm um, as you can see as you already understood i'm not on twitter <laughs> but <laughs> that's like once in a decade so not on twitter but if you're on instagram or on linkedin you're gonna find cost manjita pretty easily and then you just dm me and yeah we can we can catch up fantastic Fantastic. So that website again is getmason.io and you can find mm -hmm. out all the information there. We will of course link to the website and Costa's LinkedIn and Instagram profiles. And if we can dig it out, maybe the Twitter profile as well, just so you can go have a look at the tweet she wrote 10 years ago. Uh, we'll put all of that uh, in the show notes, of course. So Kos, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a real treat. Um, really enjoyed getting to know a bit about a bit more about Mason and what you guys are doing and it sounds fantastic. So thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. No problem. It's been great, hasn't it? Great conversation. As I said, all of the links, the notes and the transcript will be available on our website, ecommercepodcast.com. Net. And if you sign up to our newsletter, they will be coming straight to your inbox. Huge thanks again to Cos for joining me today. Now be sure to follow the e-commerce podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, because we've got yet more great conversations lined up and I don't want you to miss any of them. And in case no one has told you yet today, you are awesome. Yes, you are. Created awesome. It's just a burden you have to bear. Cos has to bear it. I have to bear it. And you've we got all to bear it to. as well. We all have to bear it. That's right. Uh, the e-commerce podcast is produced by Orion Media. You can find our entire archive of episodes on your favorite podcast app. The team that makes this show possible is Sadaf Bain on Estella Robin and Tanya Hutzalak. Our theme song was written by Josh Edmondson. And as I mentioned, if you would like to read the transcript or show notes, head over to the website ecommercepodcast.com. Net. They're all there waiting for you. Yes, they are. So that's it from me. That's it from Cos. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic week wherever you are in the world. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.